Hey, welcome to the fifth episode of Marks and Chill. In today's episode, we discuss the second manuscript of the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844. And today's chapter is titled Antithesis of Capital and Labor, Land of Property and Capital. So essentially, today we're going to talk about how labor and capital are in opposition to each other, despite us believing that they're for the benefit of one another. First of all, according to Marx, the worker has the misfortune to be living capital, and we lose interest every moment that we are not working. Meaning we're not making profit when we don't work, but also meaning that we don't have value when we don't work. The value of the worker and our existence is also viewed as a commodity. Commodity, by the way, being something that you can reproduce without having any uniqueness, for example, milk. The differences are very minor, and in a pinch, you will have any milk that you can find if you really want it, right? The worker produces money, but money also produces the worker. The worker produces themselves a as a worker, and it is the product of the entire cycle. To the human who is nothing more than a worker, their human qualities only exist to create money, and it will be separate from them. But because humans and money are separate, this foreignness also seems like it's something real. As soon as there is no money to pay the worker, they have no work, they have no pay, and since they only exist as a human being, only as a worker, so they might as well go bury themselves or starve to death. The worker exists as a worker only when they exist as themselves for money. And they exist as money only when some money exists for them. The existence of money is the worker's existence in life and it determines their life in a way that is indifferent to the worker. And that's a kind of a funny relationship, right? If there isn't money to pay you, then you can't be a worker. But being a worker makes money, so it's kind of a... So that's why I feel like Marx is saying the worker is the product of that cycle. Capitalism, therefore, does not recognize the unemployed worker. The beggar, the unemployed, the criminal, they only exist for others. For doctors, judges, grave diggers, etc. I think that's actually kind of an interesting observation that unless you're a worker, society does not care about you except for the people that have to deal with you like police, judges, the hospital, workers. Most of us go on about our lives as if they don't exist. The workers' needs are only to be maintained as long as they're working and as long as it prevents other workers from dying out. What they get paid for their labor have the same significance as the maintenance and servicing that any other tool requires. Which is why wages belong to the necessary cost of the capitalists and their money and must not be greater than that, no greater than to provide maintenance and servicing. Which goes to show that wage is not a reward for the worker, wage is just like a maintenance to the whole machine of producing money. And I think we already like inherently know that, but when you see it broken down like this, it makes a lot more sense. Production doesn't produce man as a commodity, but it produces them as mentally and physically dehumanized being. Immorality, deformity, and dulling of the workers and the capitalist. The true purpose of production is the total sum of the annual savings and the interest that the workers bring. So basically, we're just machines in the cycle and we're here to be cost effective, but also for the sake of producing money, which is the obvious one, of course. Now, in the next part, I think Marx is just throwing a little bit more shade to the whole capitalist ideology because he says it was a great achievement that English capitalism elevates labor to the position of its sole principle. But it should clarify the inverse relation between wages and interest on capital. And the fact that the capitalist can normally only gain by keeping wages low. The capitalist and the worker taking advantage of one another is the normal relationship between them. Like, we justify capitalism as saying that there's honor and worth in labor, right? Like. The whole purpose of capitalism is the ability to work, the opportunity for everybody to work as hard as they can and survive and gain for themselves. However, when you break it down, he's saying the money that you're gonna make and the wages that you pay your workers, they have an inverse relationship. You will only make money when you keep the wages low. It's an inherently exploitative relationship. Now, the relations of private property containing them the relation of private property as labor, private property as capital, and the mutual relation between capital and labor. There is the production of human activity as labor, 
an activity that is alien to humans, nature, consciousness, and the expression of life for reasons of which I've already discussed in previous videos. So if you're not all caught up, make sure you watch my previous videos, especially A Strange Labor. And on the other hand, there is the production of the object of human activity as capital, in which all the natural and social characteristics of the object is distinguished and does not seem to be associated with any human relation. While money remains the same in all different and social manifestations, the human, however, loses their humanity, but not money. This contradiction is the downfall of the entire private property relationship. So once again, Marx is pointing out during this whole making money process, humans, we lose our humanity. However, money at all stages doesn't transform. It's always like it always has worth. But we as humans, we might lose our worth. We might lose our worth if we don't work. We might lose our worth if we're deformed or if we get sick due to doing the same job over and over again. Maybe you get injured at work, right? Or even just an emotional like you lose your humanity on an emotional level through the process of making money through your job so once again there's an imbalanced relationship between labor and money mark says it is another great achievement that modern english capitalism declared a rent of land to be the difference in the interest yielded of the land to have to make it seem as if the landowner's allegiances and identity were only with the interest of society and to have anticipated that the movement of real world would transform the landowner into a capitalist and therefore sharpen the contradiction between capital and labor. So once again, he's telling us it's kind of amazing that capitalism will make you believe that rent is fair. It's fair to ask people for rent of the land. But as we discussed in a previous video, the one about rent of land, we also got to find out that landowners don't have the same interest in mind as all other capitalists, let alone all of society. So it's kind of amazing that we have this idea that it's somehow fair to charge people rent and to think that landowners are on the side of society. The distinction between capital and land, between profit and rent, wages and agriculture and industry and immovable and movable private property, these distinctions are not rooted in nature but in a historical distinction. In industry as opposed to immovable landed property, which to me means like movable property being like i guess like things that you can literally move like you can move machinery you can move even your whole entire business but you can't necessarily move like your farm because it's literally the land so in industry as opposed to like machinery it is only expressed the way in which industry came into being and its difference from agriculture in which industry developed industry developed in agriculture but we only discuss how it liberated us from agriculture this distinction only exists as a special sort of work as long as industry town life develops over and against landed property meaning aristocratic feudal life and itself continues to bear the feudal character of its opposite monopoly craft guild corporations industry perpetuates the idea that labor has a social significance much like in feudal aristocratic life it has not reached the stage in which it becomes separate from these things it has not become liberated capital meaning that we highly regard industry as if it's somehow better than when we were serfs back in when you know feudal life but we actually just moved on to a different kind of feudal relationship because we still have monopolies we still have crafts we still have guilds, we still have corporations, and we still have aristocracy. Liberated industry and liberated capital are the necessary development of labor. The power of industry over its opposite aristocratic feudal life slash landed property is revealed in the emergence of agriculture as a real industry. With the transformation of the slave into a free worker, the landlord themselves transforms into a captain of industry, and the landowner becomes a capitalist through the tenant farmer. The tenant farmer creates the landowner's economic existence for the rent of their land only exists due to the competition between farmers. And in the case of the tenant farmer, the landlord has already become a capitalist. And the farmer, a capitalist involved in agriculture, you know, on a smaller scale, they share their sense of hard work. But the landlord knows that the farmer is from a different line of descent, 
the landowner knows the capitalist, the farmer in this case, as beneath them, as an enriched slave of yesterday, and sees him as a threat. In this section, we're gonna refer to the tenant farmer as a capitalist. On the other hand, the capitalist knows the landowner as a cruel idle master. The capitalist owes all their present social significance, possessions, and pleasures, meaning the tenant farmer is like in debt to the landowner, right? They see in the landlord a contradiction of free industry and to free capital. They both, however, feel bitter about the other. The landowner reminisces about the noble lineage of their property, and when they discuss economics, they believe that only agriculture is productive. But at the same time, they depict the capitalist as a deceitful, greedy, rebellious, heartless, and soulless person who's separate from the community and freely trades it away, as someone without honor nor principles. But also the farmer has been portrayed as slaves that refused, when serfdom was abolished, to stop being property of the landowner. Sound familiar? However, there are also some patriotic depictions which never for a moment abandon the respectable petty bourgeois Philistine horizons. Movable property, meaning industry, machines, etc., show the miracle of industry and progress. It pities its adversary as a simpleton who wants to replace moral capital and free labor by brute force and serve them. It depicts him as a Don Quixote who, under the guise of respectability, is concealing their inability to progress, greed, selfishness, and evil intent. It declares them an artful monopolist and shows the history of their cruelty and degradation. It claims to have obtained political freedom for all, to have brought together different worlds, to have created trade promoting friendship between people, to have created pure morality and a pleasant culture, to have given people civilized needs instead of crude wants and the means to satisfy them. Meanwhile, it claims the landowner, a parasitic grain profiteer, raises the price of the people's basic necessities and forces the capitalists to raise wages without increasing productivity, which impedes the growth of nations and annual income, therefore producing a general decline while they exploit every advantage of modern civilization without working for it nor ending his feudal prejudices. Let them, for whom the cultivation of the land and the land itself exist only as a source of money, let them just take a look at their tenant farmer and say whether they are sly scoundrels who for a long time belong to free industry and to lovely trade even though they protest about history or ethical and political goals. Everything which they are to justify themselves is only true of the cultivator of the land, the capitalists and the laborers of whom the landowner is the enemy. Thus they give evidence against themselves. Movable property claims that without capital landed property is dead, that its civilized victory has discovered and made human labor the source of wealth. So once again we return to the same issue that we've been discussing that it's the human being that produces all the wealth. The real course of development results in the necessary victory of the capitalist over the landowner. Just as the developed would over the undeveloped, movement must triumph over immobility. Then the property in its distinction from capital is private property, still afflicted by local and political prejudices. Capital which has not extradited itself from its entanglement with the world and found the foreign property to itself not yet money capital not yet fully developed. So what does this even mean? So industry shows, you know, we're progressing, we're making money, and pretty much declares anybody who's against industry as somebody who's like, like Don Quixote. Don Quixote was, what, from what I remember, he wanted to be like this hero, like the novels that he would read, but he was this really dumb, backwards, dumb, like, that's the, only, that's the only way I can describe it. He would just be doing dumb stuff. And if anything ever worked out in his favor, it was because of pure luck. But it was basically like a caricature of the old heroes that, you know, used to exist in literature for a long time. So basically, we're saying here that anybody who opposes industry must just be a dumbass dude who's just very simple-minded. And although they might have good in their heart, they just don't know any better. They're, they're idiots. And, of course, at the same time, industry or progress, they justify having systems in place that don't work at all. For example, having something like the landlord, which exploits all the advantages of civilization, and they're pretty much just parasites. Like, a landlord doesn't really have to do any work other than collect their paycheck, basically. 
and a system that of course that reveals when you really look into it that everything that's creating value is the human being and not necessarily just the land because you need the human to cultivate the land but yet we take all these things that it's telling us at face value despite them being incorrect then the property in its distinction from capital is private property still afflicted by local and political prejudices capital which has not been extradited itself from this entanglement with the world and found the form property to itself not yet money capital not yet fully developed the character of private property is expressed by labor capital and the relation between these two and the movement through which these have to pass is first unmediated or mediated unity of the two capital and labor at, at first still unified then though separated they develop and promote each other as other positive conditions second the two in opposition mutually excluding each other the worker knows the capital as their own non-existence and vice versa each tries to rob one another of their existence and third opposition of each to itself capital is stored up labor labor is labor as such it splits into capital itself and interest and this latter again into interest and profit the capitalist is completely sacrificed he falls into the working class while the worker becomes a capitalist labor as a moment of capital its cost thus the wages of labor a sacrifice of capital splitting the labor into labor itself and wages of labor the worker himself splits into a capital and a commodity a clash of mutual contradictions and that's where the manuscript ends so basically all these things that we're told that make sense in capitalism they're beneficial they're mutually supportive of one another they all clash even though we're supposed to believe that it's a whole system of things that work together in harmony. Let me know what you thought about today's episode. I thought this was a very interesting reading, even though it took me a while to get to it. I'm really sorry, you guys. <laughs> this is the first time since like late 2019 that I go two weeks without posting a video, and I'm really sorry that I was late this week. Like, I'm sure for many of you, February for some reason was just mentally very draining just like from everything that's going on in the world it's been a year now that we've been like in this weird whatever situation you're in because of the pandemic i just had to give myself a little bit of rest this month if you are not yet following me on tiktok please follow me on tiktok <laughs> uh, you know i've been feeling really drained and kind of burned out from youtube for a, for a little bit now um and tiktok is really helping me like really enjoy the editing process once again which is why i started doing youtube in the first place i love making videos editing having fun so join me on tiktok if you haven't already um i'm also on twitter of course instagram but right now i feel like tiktok is really fun and like i just i just need some fun in my life right now <laughs> because like don't get me wrong i love youtube but it is a lot of work i guess especially because we've got a whole year where i feel like all i'm doing is working and like yeah maybe once a week i go see my family maybe here and there i get the energy to go like go hiking or do yoga at home or something but i've mostly just been working and working so it kind of makes sense that i was like burned out this past month but thank you so much for everybody that's been watching i do notice in my analytics that you guys watch the marks and chill videos for way longer way longer than any of my other videos so which is kind of crazy because i thought it was literally gonna be like social suicide and i literally thought i was gonna get like mass unsubscriptions from everybody that follows me and i can't believe that you haven't <laughs> so thank you so much i'm glad that you're enjoying these videos i'm enjoying them too because you know it was like i shared with you guys it was my goal to read marks it is a little bit more work than any other video but um i do enjoy it and i enjoy knowing that you guys enjoy it too but anyways thank you for watching if you still are subscribe if you like to continue talking about world domination follow me on tiktok and i'll see you in the next one